that is the best song ever written. You know, Dick Emery, I'm sorry. You know, trust and obey. Okay, it, it, it's on the list, but great is thy faithfulness. And our God has been faithful to us this week. This week we have celebrated our lovely sister, Evelyn, going home. And this morning we're going to celebrate a new life, Madeline. All right. And today is a guitar-free Sunday. Yeah, you're supposed to laugh. You're not supposed to be happy about it. But, but, uh, all right. No, nope, guitar-free Sunday today. All right. Well, brothers and sisters, family of God, let's stand, and we're going to sing our first song. It's called Forever. seated. Pastor Mark, come on up here, brother. Thank you, Don. Praise team. We're having a baby, baby dedication this morning. Children are a gift from our God. God has given us children, and children obviously are a great responsibility, and we need to care for them but they're also a gift from God, and we get to enjoy them, have the opportunity to enjoy them and to raise them up and to give them guidance. And for a few short years, they're present with us. And so it seems appropriate for us to dedicate a child to the Lord. Psalm 127 says, proclaim, it proclaims that sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are reward from him. 
So we want to remember God in this whole process. And so Beth has reached out to us and asked if we would dedicate her daughter, Madeline, who's now about six and a half months old, and uh, her other son and daughter are here with us, and so we're going to do that this morning. We're reminded in 1 Samuel that Hannah, wonderful godly woman, presented her son Samuel to the Lord. In Luke 2, we read that Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to Jerusalem, to the temple, to be dedicated. In the same way, Beth Arnold brings her baby, Madeline, presenting her first, presenting um, first herself and then Madeline before the Lord. When we dedicate a child to the Lord, we are doing something else. We are dedicating parents as well. I'm pleased that Beth is a believer in Christ, and I'm glad you are connected to Blue Haven Ranch, uh, an organization, a, a ministry that we have recently partnered with, and we are just enjoying that relationship and the, the vision and the goals and the service that they, they provide. Beth, by coming forward before God and his people, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourself and your daughter Madeline to the Lord? If so, please respond by saying, I do. I do. All right. If you will come on up and do your, um, do your son and daughter want to come too? Great. This is Ian and Alora. I'm glad to have them here as well. Having come freely, I ask now that you enter into the following commitment in the presence of God and his people, so that Madeline may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, do you vow, by God's help, and in partnership with Christians, to provide Madeline a Christian home of love and peace, to raise her in the truth of our Lord's instruction and, do, and to encourage her to one day trust Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. I do. Yes. Praise God. May I hold her? Can you all see the beauty of this child? Isn't she sweet? quiet. <laughs> I think you have a, a blessing here. I do. And I'm just, it's, it's an honor to be able to hold her. So I'm going to pray for you and your whole family at this time. Father, I thank you for Beth having the desire to honor you and to bring her daughter into a special relationship with you. We do pray, Father, for the entire family, that you would bless them, that you would give them your joy and your peace, and your kindness, and your love. And I pray for Madeline, Father, right now, a special child. I pray, Father, that she will um, grow up seeing the character of Christ in this family. And, Father, that she will come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ at a young age and follow him all the days of her life. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you bless them with their hand, with your hands? Thank you. Thank she, she did great. <laughs> Don. Yes. 
soul with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still water into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough. Oh 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. What of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. together today to worship you, to praise you, to love you and exalt your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated except for Patrick, who's going to come and talk to us about some of the evangelism outreach that he and Herb are doing. So Patrick, why don't you come on up here, brother?
morning. We're excited about uh, some evangelism happenings here at the church. And we wanted to give you an update and uh, tell you again that uh, you are, you okay, Art? All right. And uh, tell you that uh, you are invited to our Wednesday evening uh, Bible study classes on evangelism. And uh, we also hope to hold some uh, seminars uh, coming up at the first part of the year. One of my favorite verses is uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 6, where Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. So we know in evangelism that if God is moving in a person's heart, he can use anything we say. But if God is not moving, we can give the greatest evangelistic presentation and nothing will work if God is not first working. Jesus said in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So the Father first has to draw people to the Son. If you think about it also, the Bible says that faith and repentance are gifts that God gives. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Philippians 1, 29. It is by grace we are saved. It is a gift of God. And 2 Timothy 2.25 says that God grants repentance. And in the parable of the soil in Mark 4.20, Jesus says that people have to be put on the good soil in order to be saved. I volunteered on an evangelism phone line for 20 years. And about uh, 10 years ago, this, this phone line, it went 24-7, so you could get on at any time, and anybody that wanted to get on could get on at any time. It was a phone line and a chat line. Well, it was the night after the 4th of July, and it was midnight, and I got on the phone line, and fireworks were about to explode. A gentleman by the name of Jason called me up, and we could take phone calls from home, and so that's where I was taking the phone calls. And uh, he started out by saying, I don't believe in God, I hate Christians and the Christian religion, and he found Christianity very limiting. Well, after some back and forth uh, discussing our universal sin and the need for repentance and faith and for God to move in a person's heart, uh, Jason was not convinced at all, and he told me that the main reason, actually, that he called was to see if I could change his mind. He said, how can you make me believe and become a Christian? Well, this was almost a gotcha challenge that he had given several people on the phone line many times before. And so I just, I said, well, Jason, this is really quite a simple one. I said, I can't make you believe. I can't save you. Because that's God's prerogative. So unless, again, that God is moving in someone's heart, unless he does radical heart surgery, Ezekiel 36, 26, God says that he has to take out a heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. And I said, Jason, unless God does heart surgery on you, nothing I say is going to make a difference. He paused for a little while, and he said, I've never heard anybody say that to me. Now, I don't know what happened to Jason, but I know one thing for sure, that my own conversion and anyone else's for that matter, as Romans 9, 16 says, depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So again, we hope that uh, you'll enjoy, uh, join us in our evangelism endeavors as we go forward. And uh, we had another successful day out in the neighborhood uh, yesterday, and I wanted uh, Herb to come up and give a uh, quick update. Well, we uh, were blessed by God yesterday. We go out, uh, hopefully humbly, uh, knowing that we can do nothing apart from God's Holy Spirit, who uh, works within us and also works in the hearts of the people with whom we speak. 
And uh, our purpose uh, was not so much to get them to come to uh, Oak Hills, although that's a byproduct, but was to get them saved. And uh, it's quite amazing, uh, we living in the Bible Belt, that uh, there are so many people that do not know the way of salvation. Uh, they simply don't know. Usually when we uh, will ask them a question of, as to whether or not they have certainty that if they were to die, that they would go to heaven. And uh, one fellow told us outright, no, I, I, I don't think so. I'm not sure. And the amazing thing is that many of these people have been in evangelical congregations for years. That for one, some reason, perhaps the devil working against them, uh, they simply don't know. And usually there is a works answer. We asked one young fellow that... Uh, uh, had kind of an Indian background, a student at Argyle High School, and uh, he, he just didn't have any idea. And uh, I don't want to stand up here too long, so I will tell you this. Through the grace of God, two people received to uh, pray to receive Jesus yesterday. Uh, the, uh, the student in the uh, ninth grade uh, at Argyle, uh, again with Indian background, his mother came to the door later on, but we went right through the uh, entire presentation with him, and uh, at the end, after sharing Jesus with him, we said, does this make sense to you? And he said, yes. And uh, we said, well, would you like to have that assurance of salvation as well, and know that when you die that you will go to heaven? And he said, yes. So I said, well, all right, I'm going to pray, and then uh, I want you to pray after me. And we took him through this in his prayer. And uh, he acknowledged that Jesus was his Savior and God, and we welcomed him into the kingdom of God. We were all set to bring him to church. He already agreed to that. I was going to come by because he's a neighbor. We're out here in Waterbrook, which is a mission field right in our backyard. And uh, his mother came to the door, and uh, she hadn't heard the rest of the conversation or anything, and probably wasn't sure who in the world we were. And so uh, she said, well, we have a family uh, thing that we, ha we have to go to. But uh, I'm going to follow up during the week. Uh, we don't let people off easy. Uh, <laughs> sometimes they try to close the door a little bit, and uh, uh, Patrick knows about that. You know, he really shared with that, uh, with an engineer from Massachusetts who's only been in Waterbrook for a short period of time. And uh, we haven't given up on him. He's an out-and-out -out agnostic, and uh, he just doesn't believe. But in addition to uh, this fellow, uh, Sharon is his name, the uh, ninth grader, uh, another fellow uh, we talked to, his name was Roma, uh, Yalamanichi, and uh, we prayed for him also. He was a, uh, an older man, uh, lives right in the neighborhood, and uh, we took him through the gospel presentation, and afterwards we, uh, he bowed his head, and uh, he received Jesus as his Savior as well. So that was two people of all the people that we visited yesterday. So God is moving. And uh, we, are, uh, we, had, we have four ladies that are involved with uh, Patrick and myself now, uh, Julie and uh, Tina, and uh, Nancy was with us yesterday. And uh, Nancy, why don't you just say just a, a couple of words about what your experience was. Can you do that? You want a microphone? No, go ahead. Here that you had. I was just supposed to smile and say, how are you? And <laughs> just, I think I maybe ask, um, do you have a church home or something kind of like that? But Patrick, Patrick and uh, Herb just are amazing, and Jesus is our Savior, and it was great. Praise God. Well, it's great working with uh, everyone. Who did I miss? Julie and Tina. And, uh, yeah, and uh, also uh, Debbie called me uh, yesterday, and she said, you know, do you, did you get another lady? Because we like to go out with two men and a lady or two lady and a man. And uh, she said, you know, if you don't have somebody, you know, I'd be happy to come out. So people are really responding. 
And unfortunately, uh, not that many people, are, not many of that chur churches are actually involved evangelistically. And I think there's the fear of rejection, and we were not rejected. There's a fear of not knowing what to say, and we can teach people what to say. And then there's the fear that, oh, my own life is not what it should be, so uh, who am I to go out? I have to wait till I, 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 I'm living a better life. Well, in that case, we'll never do it. So uh, we praise God for the opportunity that God has given us. We are going out every Saturday. Uh, we want to get the other people trained, and then we'll kind of spill a little bit and, on, and get them so that they can, uh, in addition, bring other people into the, uh, the work. And uh, we'd like to see God really pour out his spirit on this church with many people who are walking in deep, dark, spiritual darkness uh, will come into the light of Jesus Christ and uh, know him as Savior. So uh, let me just pray real quickly for the, uh, the people we talked to yesterday, and then we'll uh, get on with our service here. Father God, we thank you so much for your, your grace and your mercy that you, you love these people uh, very much, and you went to the cross at Calvary to demonstrate your love, and we know that all who believe in you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For this we are grateful. We pray, Lord God, for Darren, who had a fall, a terrible fall and an eye injury, and yet he uh, spoke with us uh, yesterday, and we pray that you would, uh, that you would uh, heal him, Lord. We know you heal all who came to you by word and touch and the laying on of hands during your earthly ministry. We pray that you would touch Darren and make him well. Father, we thank you so much for Sharon, the 15-year-old who received you as Savior and God by the power of the Holy Spirit yesterday. Father, let that word sink deeply into his heart and let him be committed. And Father, if we have that opportunity, uh, let us be a church for him where he can grow in his faith. We pray for Rom Roma, uh, Yala Manchili, and uh, he was a former Hindu. And we, uh, Lord God, we, we just ask that you would touch him, that he'd discard this, uh, this religion where they believe in 330 million gods and trust in the Lord God Almighty, the King of creation, our Savior and our God, Jesus Christ. We pray for Chris, who is an agnostic, a very smart young man. Uh, Father, we ask that the word of God that doesn't return void will sink in and that he will embrace Jesus too as his Savior. We know that nothing is too difficult for you. And finally, Lord, we pray for, for Judy. I don't know if Judy, is Judy here? Uh, yeah, there you are. Okay, <laughs> make sure I can, I'm seeing right. Yeah, we pray for you, Judy, too, that God will bless you and be with you mightily. Uh, it's been so great. You've been so gracious and received us so well, and uh, we thank you for your, uh, your hospitality. So God bless you. Father God, bless this church. Help us to continually be steadfast in our faith in Jesus Christ until that glorious day when we see him face to face and live with him in heaven forever. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, so we'll start with an announcement about lunch. I hope everyone here knows that we have a uh, Thanksgiving fellowship today for the church. So there are several men uh, right now in the kitchen that are slicing brisket and smoked turkey and ham and sausage and all of the sides that many people brought to go along with that. So please do stay with us um, after church to enjoy a fellowship feast. Uh, this is the time in our service that we share prayers and we pray for one another. Uh, we do have quite a few people who are either recovering from uh, surgeries or illness. And so um, I will start the prayer and please join me. Father God, we praise you and we thank you. We glorify your name, Lord. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you that we may pray together that you have made us a family in Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you would be with Gary Ray and his family as they are dealing with the loss of his mother. We praise you that she's with you in heaven and her faith has been made sight. Lord, we just ask that you would comfort them as there are always things to take care of when a loved one passes and Gary is away doing just that, taking care of his family. We also pray for Diane Tutini 
who has lost her brother Bill. He passed peacefully on Friday night. And so again, Father, we know that your timing is perfect and we know that Bill is with you in heaven. We just ask for comfort for Diane and her family as they will miss him in the coming days and they will grieve not having him with them. Father, we also lift up Benjamin Laura and his family. Benjamin continues to gain strength and we thank you. We thank you for working in his full recovery after a car accident and we pray that you would comfort his wife and children as their lives continue to adjust to the schedules of therapy and caring for Benjamin at home. But what a blessing, Father. What a wonderful blessing for this family that they're together, and we hope that they'll be back with us soon. Father, we ask that you would be with Scott Himmel and his wife as he continues to heal from a motorcycle accident. We pray for your provision and the cost of his therapy. He will have many months of therapy, and Lord, we just ask that you would provide for them, that you would bring people into their lives who can help, and that you would work a miracle in his full healing. Lord, we lift up Dan and Jan Emery's, or Doug and Jim Emery's pastor, Ray Berry. He's in Nebraska, and he is recovering now from a foot amputation this week. Father, if you would just please Guide him in this time of adjustment after losing a limb. Comfort him, encourage him, equip his medical team, Father, that they would care for him well and that he would recover well. We pray that he would rely on you through this entire process. And Father, we lift up Grayson Hall. He's continuing his leukemia treatments. For this little boy, it's been such a long road. Father, we just ask that you would comfort his family and bring him peace, that these treatments would be over soon. And we pray for his mom, who is pregnant. She's seven months pregnant, and we just pray that, that this would go well, that she would be able to carry the baby to full term, and that it would be such a blessing. Father, we were so blessed to have the dedication of Madeline here today, and we just thank you for these little ones. We thank you for the work that you're doing in their families' lives and in their life. And may we all take the dedication seriously of what we can show as an example to children in our own lives. Father, we lift up Duke Clark as he's continuing treatments for cancer, and we pray that he would be fully healed. Continue to encourage he and Mary in this journey. Father, we lift up Martha Mason as she is dealing with trouble in her right eye. And again, we just look to you, the great healer, the great provider, Father, that you will take care of us, that you will provide and see us through the trials of life. We thank you for Herb and Patrick and everyone who has been participating in the evangelism ministry and the discipleship ministries here at Oak Hills. Father, as Herb and Patrick both shared, it's not about the words that we say or the things that we do. It is about faith in Jesus Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit. So soften hearts, Lord. Bring people to repentance. Bring people to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Priorities. <laughs> Journalists have six words that help them discover the truth of any story and help them to tell it with punch and power. Those six words are who, what, when, where, why, and how. And I decided to use those six words in preparing today's message. As I look through the scriptures, it just seemed to lay out that way. And so that's what we're going to do. The first question is, who? Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing praises to the Lord, you, his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Saints. Who are the saints? I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Um, I became a Christian and I went to Bible college with almost no knowledge. 
I had dated a, a woman who was uh, a young gal who was Catholic, and so I'd heard of saints, and I had this idea of some very distant, very holy person. But when I got to Bible college, I remember the first semester, somebody was telling us about all the riches we have in Christ. And one of those is that we, Christians, are his saints, literally sanctified ones. He has sanctified us, all of us. Well, this was news to me. I got kind of excited. And so I went to work that afternoon. I worked at Publix Grocery Store. I went into the grocery store. First thing I saw, a guy, we'd had some spiritual conversations. He was overworking produce. And so I went over, the, over to him, and I said, hey, it's great to see you. And I, I just found out something. We are saints. And he kind of looked at me, you know, and he said, shh, shh, shh. There's a customer right next to him. He didn't want the customer to think we were crazy. <laughs> the point is, we are saints, and it is us who are to give thanks. Now let's look at the what. What are we to give thanks for? Giving thanks begins with the heart. May our hearts take in the goodness of our God. May we reflect on all he has done for us, which is too long to list, really. For his grace in saving us, for sustaining us in a relationship with himself. Remember that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He has made us alive together with Christ. The prophet Isaiah predicted what God would do through Messiah. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. What more could the Son of God do for us than that? He suffered and died on the cross. And by the way, Isaiah is a prophet writing seven centuries before the fact, telling what will happen in great detail. In fact, 25 different predictions in this one chapter. Details about Christ the Messiah, his life, his death, and afterwards. What more could he do than to step up when our sins, the things that I've done wrong, the things that we've all done wrong, and what is sin? We used to teach kids, sin is anything that we say, think, or do that breaks God's heart and makes him sad. And we've all done those things, haven't we? We've all fallen short. I am a pastor, but I will stand up here and tell you I fell short before I was a Christian, and I try to do good, but I still fall short. And the wonderful thing is, he knew all that about me. He knows about all of us. He loves us. And he sent Messiah to die as a payment for our sins. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. He took that death for us. And so he can offer us forgiveness when we believe in Christ, when we believe in him. We place our faith in him. And that is the greatest thing that we can give thanks for. But there's so much more. He continues to sustain us. You got up this morning. He gave you a new day. You look out at this beautiful weather. People have been talking this morning about how gorgeous the weather has been. You guys enjoying this? Are you enjoying seeing the beauty of the leaves changing? Debbie and I just took a trip up to northwest Arkansas. Beautiful. Our God is a great artist. He gives that to us. Think about it. What has God done for us? Well, you're living on the most incredible biosphere. I recently heard scientists have discovered that there are now 200 things that have to be true all at the same time, like a star and the right kind of star and the right distance from the star and just the right tilt of the planet. 
and so much more. 200 things that have to be in place at one time for life to exist. Our God created that biosphere. And who did he create it for? For you. He loves you that much. You know, we have blessings right now that others are praying they might have. We have so much to give thanks for. Well, now, how about the Thanksgiving, the the when? When are we to give thanks? Who here would say, at mealtimes? Raise your hand. I agree with that. Where is it found? How about 1 Timothy chapter 4? For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Another verse, 1 Thessalonians 5. Give thanks in some circumstances. No. Oh, yeah. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So when, according to this verse, in all circumstances, which means all the time, right? I fall short of that. But as I've been preparing this message, I've been thinking, I need to do that more. Maybe you will too. Now, where is this thanksgiving to take place? Psalm 35, I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. Thanksgiving can take place individually or corporately, which is this verse. This is the congregation. This is corporate thanksgiving. This is thanksgiving as a group. And that's a very appropriate thing. You know, when we got this building, we came came and we had a special reason to give thanks. If you don't know the story of this building, we lived in a, uh, we, we were housed in a building just down the street, which met our needs. It was everything that we needed, but it was about a 30 year old building. There were things like the fact that the hallway that we met in for worship was long and narrow, not the best for congregational singing. And a group came to us and they said, we would like to buy your building. Okay, well, we're open to that. And they made a very low offer and we said, this building and this land and building is already paid for. So we could only do this if you offered to give us land and give us enough money to build the entire building debt-free. And they said, okay. (laughs) And they even recommended the builder, Larry Cole, a former Dallas cowboy, who for 40 years has been building buildings in this area. Lots of experience. Great guy to work with. And so that began the process. And Many of you had input. We got to design it exactly the way we wanted. Now think of it. Put yourself in this position. Suppose somebody came to you and said, we want to build you your dream home with everything that you want, and we'll pay for it, and you'll move in debt-free. Would you give thanks? (laughs) That's what happened. So here we are. We get to give thanks in the congregation. In addition to giving thanks in the congregation corporately, we're going to use an old term here. We can go to our prayer closet. Our prayer closet. What in the world is that? In Matthew 6, 
Jesus contrasts those who pray in public to gain admiration of people around them with instructions for his disciples to pray in the innermost area of their homes as far away from the public eye as possible. He said, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The word room means the inner storage chamber or secret room. And thus it became known as the prayer closet. Jesus was communicating that prayer is about God. It's not about gaining the applause of people. Oh, you prayed so well. It's about approaching God who loves us and who desires to have communion with us. Amazingly, he wants us to come to him. And he doesn't want us to be distracted by all those around us. Some Christians have taken Jesus' admonition literally and set aside a room or even a closet dedicated to prayer. Most Christians who want to follow this instruction simply identify a specific quiet place. It can be a certain chair in the house. It can be a table. It can be a desk where they can sit and be quiet and alone. For some of you, it may be your car. As you travel to work each day, you spend time praying to the Lord. Wherever it is, God encourages us to use that time to build into our lives this relationship that we have available 24-7. Sometimes it's difficult. We've been talking about kids this morning and and their demands. and, 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 And it's a wonderful joy to have children, but it also uses a lot of time, too. And so Susanna Wesley, John Wesley's mother, famously, she had a lot of kids. And so sometimes in order to get time alone with the Lord, she would have this apron on and the kids are coming at her and she needs to pray real quick. She'd grab the apron, pull it over her head (laughs) and pray. Whatever it takes, make time for the Lord. He loves to be with you. What are we to give thanks for? Very simply, him. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Common theme in the Psalms. Give thanks to the Lord, and for tells us the reason. He is good. No matter how dark the circumstances, our God is good. His love endures forever. Christians have had an in-house debate for millennia. Can a true believer in Christ lose his or her salvation? And many good people have weighed in on this, and there have been different points of view for two millennia, really. My answer is, if you are truly in Christ you can never be put out of Christ. Here's some reasons and some thoughts on that. You are part of his body. When you put your faith in Christ, he included you in the body of Christ. Christ is the head and all believers form this body of Christ that's talked about in Scripture. All right. Can you imagine God cutting off Christ's arm? No. If the arm is sick, his job is to heal the arm. He won't cut it off. Another thought. You have new life. We were separated and in a sense spiritually dead before we came to faith in Christ. But once we trust him for salvation through the cross, We have new life. 
Our God is not a cosmic abortionist. He will not take the new life he has created and kill it. You didn't save yourself, did you? No, Jesus died for you, is ever more alive for you. The saving was done at the cross. So if I didn't save myself, I can't have any part in causing me to be separated from him. Now, one thing is conditional, however. One thing is conditional. If I abide in Christ, I will be blessed in that fellowship. I'll be close to God. But if sin creeps in, I will cease to abide in him while allowing sin in my life. Sin cannot abide with God. But God will never cast me out of heaven. Um, there's a story of three people died one day and went to the gates of heaven, and they're outside of heaven, and an angel comes out and greets them. And they're a doctor, a nurse, and an insurance agent. And um, the doctor says, I'd like to come into heaven. And so the angel says, well, just a minute, I'll go check the records. And he goes in, and he comes back out and says, good news, you're in. And so he goes on it. Well, the nurse, encouraged by this news, she steps up. She says, well, I'd like to come in. And he says, just a minute, let me go check the book of life, and I'll be right back. Good news, you're in. So now we come to the medical insurance agent. And he says, I'd like to come into heaven. And he says, let me go check. And so he goes in to check, and he comes out, and he says, good news, you're in for three days. <laughs> That's not how salvation works. <laughs> Let me give you two more reasons I believe that we are secure in Christ. God promises nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. Romans 8, in fact, it says it repeatedly, amazingly, nothing, and that includes you, will ever separate us from the love of God. Last, we are saved by the power of God. Nothing is more powerful than our mighty God. My power cannot undo his power. And his power saved me, so I know I'm saved. Therefore, let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. Think of this. When we give thanks, we are speaking directly to God. We have come into his company. The writer of Hebrews says we always have access. We always have access into the throne room of God. He invites us to come. How different humans are than God. Esther married the king, and that made her queen. And so she is married to this pagan king. But one day she hears that her people are in danger of being exterminated. And it's urgent. She's got to go and talk to the king. But there's a law that said anyone who tries to come into the king's presence uninvited, <coughs> death. So she prays and she fasts. She hasn't had an invitation. She hasn't seen the king in a long time. She goes into the throne room and kneels. And the king extends his scepter. And I think in answer to her prayers, God touched his heart. And he said, what is it that you want? What can I do for you, my queen? That's a wonderful story, but think about it. God's different. He invites us to come into his presence 24-7. He welcomes us. We are his children. He desires time with us. 
Next, how are we to give thanks? How do you do it? How, how do we do this? Ephesians 5, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, or songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This speaks of public thanks and praise directed to God. And it's kind of like a hot coal. You've heard the analogy, perhaps, that we, as we fellowship together, it's like one hot coal being in the midst of a group of hot coals. One time I tried to impress a girl, this was long before I was married, and I tried to heat coals up, and I took some frozen chicken out, and I put it on the grill. And it turned out, burned on the outside, with still ice crystals on the inside. <laughs> she never went out with me again. <laughs> because God had something better, right? Coals, when they are together, they reinforce the heat of one another. Believers, when we are together, fellowshipping together in the Lord, we reinforce that with one another. And so there is a time for public sharing of praise and thanksgiving. In fact, next week we're going to do that. We're going to have a chance to pass the mic. So you might be thinking ahead of time, if you want to participate, what you might give thanks for as we enter into this Thanksgiving season. Psalm 9 says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. So how else are we to pray? With all of our heart, right? Ever been with someone, but your mind was somewhere else? <laughs> hmm. Focus on him. Give God attention that he deserves. It takes time to get there. I, I wish I could say, boy, as soon as I start to pray, I'm in, I'm in the zone. I, I'm spiritual. No, I'm just like you. <laughs> and all of us, we're distracted by so many things, and we're not really tuned into God sometimes. And it takes time. And I'll be honest, sometimes it takes me 30 minutes of reading the Word and praying before I really feel connected to God, before I'm connecting with Him. But once I do, you know what happens? I have this tremendous joy. It's worth the investment because as I spend time with our God, he spends time with me and I sense his spirit in my life and he warms me from the inside and I have this joy flood me. Is that worth it? It really is worth the time. Why should we give thanks? A man was talking to his friend. He said, it's Thanksgiving again. What do I have to give thanks for? I can't even pay my creditors. The friend said, be thankful you're not one of your creditors. <laughs> Psalm 107. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. What's the first thing that this verse says to give thanks to the Lord for? His unfailing love. It's unfailing. And I'm glad. Human love... That fails sometimes. Recently, I was on Facebook, and I saw a friend, a woman that I know, and um, it was obvious. I don't know the details, but it was obvious someone had let her down. It happens. People fail. Love fails sometimes. But God's love it will never fail. The promises that he has made to you, he will keep. 
And even when we don't sense his presence, even when perhaps we feel far away, he's still there and he still loves us. And then we are to give thanks to his wonderful, for his wonderful deeds for mankind. What deeds? Oh, like creating the world, (laughs) creating this earth for us, perfectly balanced for life. And he gave us the ability to love, to have friendships, to be able to enjoy companionship, and so much more. So let's remember the things that he does for us. And let's look for them every day. If we look for them, we will see them. James 1 verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. When the sun goes overhead, you see the shadows change, right? But God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He always loves us. Where do good things come from? Santa? Nah, from above. Meaning from the God of heaven. If he gave good gifts yesterday, will he change? No. Stop giving? No, he never changes. Psalm 7, verse 17, God gives another reason to give thanks. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing praises of the name of the Lord Most High because of his righteousness. Do you ever get bummed because the world is not righteous? What are some things that bum you out? Anyone? All right. There is so much happening in the world today. All we have to do is flip on the TV or or log on to social media, and we start getting bad news, bad news, bad news. And our country is kind of polarized because of it. To be honest, I'm watching TV less these days. I'm paying less attention to social media. I'll hit the headlines each day just to keep abreast of what's going on, but I'm not burying my heart and my mind in bad news. But his righteousness, it's always there. He's always good. 2 Corinthians 4.15, all of this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Is God's grace reaching more people? Sometimes we might be led to think that's not the case, but it is the case. In many parts of the world, the gospel is going out, it's receiving great receptivity. Places like South Korea, places like China. There may be more Christians in China than the United States right now. Had 50,000 back right after World War II. And then they expelled all of the missionaries. They said, well, that's Christianity's dead. <laughs> no. The government, which probably estimates low, says there are 117 million Christians in China. In the South Sea Islands, the gospel is spreading. In Central America, in South America, the gospel is going out. New churches are being planted in Africa. I know many works that are happening. Patrick is trying to get back over to Africa again. Our own Tom, who teaches on Wednesday nights sometimes, is over there now. The gospel is going out. Now, if you listen to some elites, if you look too much on social media, if you listen to some newscasters, you might be led to think that Christianity is is just a heartbeat away from dying. That is not the case. The gospel is going out as we saw yesterday. Thank you, Herb. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for going out.
We are told, and I'm going to circle back to one, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 again, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. (laughs) Ever wonder, what's God's will for me? Now we know. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, say you're you're a parent uh, and your daughter is marriageable age and she meets a great guy and they're getting married. Is that a good reason to get thankful? Yeah, I mean, that's obvious, right? But what if you get bad news? What if there's a divorce in your immediate family? Or what if you go to the doctor and you get some bad news? That's harder, I admit. And I'm not real good at that but I'm trying. When we get bad news, try giving thanks. And what you may find is the bad news seems less important compared to the good news that we have Christ and he has us. Now, just a little bit more. I want to give you the benefit of thanksgiving. Psalm 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him. He helps me. My heart leaps for joy. And with my song, I praise him. Joy comes when we give thanks. I can't explain it. It's like the wind blowing. I don't know where the wind came from. And when it leaves, I don't know where it's going, but I just know it was there. And when I give thanks to the Lord, when you give thanks to the Lord, watch. See the joy come forth and enjoy it. Friends, some people will try to find joy and peace in a bottle, and that seldom satisfies. But the joy of the Lord is a thing to behold. Philippians 4 gives us another benefit. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace. The thing that rattled my cage when I began praying somehow seems better just because I prayed. Less pressing. And I don't feel like I have to control the universe in order to have peace because I know he's got it under control. Even if I don't know how it's going to turn out, I know I can trust him. So here's the application and we're done. Colossians 2 says, says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Friends, are we abounding in thanksgiving? I bet we can do better. We'll end with Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? In a word, thanks. Thank you, Father, for the grace that we have to be able to approach you and call you our Heavenly Father. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you have done for us in creating us and giving us biological life in allowing us to grow and to experience relationships and to come into a relationship with the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name, we give thanks. Wonderful little story in Luke chapter 17. Our Lord Jesus was out walking about. Apparently, he did that a lot. He and his disciples were walking toward Jerusalem, and they happened to come to the outskirts of a town, 
and there were ten men who had been afflicted with leprosy. And they cried out to Jesus, Lord, Savior, heal us, please. And Christ said, very well, you're healed. Go and show yourselves to the priests, which will certify your cure. And all ten of them start marching off, and they're heading into town to go and certify the cure. And then one of those ten did an about face and came back and fell at Jesus' feet, giving thanks. And I'm just here to tell you that we all need to be that one who is giving thanks. We got one more song to sing this morning. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Must be that one scene. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give He's given Jesus Christ to Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done. came today, I want to let you know there is food for everyone. We always have food left over. So even if you didn't plan on staying, I'm going to ask you, stay around, enjoy a plate of food and some fellowship. Father God, we thank you for the food we're about to receive, and we receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you will, go through this door, and the food is right there. <laughs> <laughs>